Jonathan Hill, and I'm organizing this series. I'll be your host tonight, and for the rest of the talks, January through May, we're basically the first Tuesday of each month, and uh, you can check our website. Just do a quick search for Suds and Science, Vermont. You'll find the full schedule. We've got an exciting lineup of folks to talk about everything from animal communication to bird migration and soil biochemical processes. Wow. It's probably something for everybody. Um, if you didn't show up early night, I'd encourage you to get here 6.30 or so, meet some other folks, get get your seat staked out. Uh, so you, can, yeah, so you don't have to kick people out of their seat. You can just be here. That's great. And uh, meet some other fellow nerds, um, people interested in science, people that know science background that's great just you know come early um, I should say so uh, again my name is Jason Hill and I work I'm a quantitative biologist and ornithologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies we are a nonprofit right here in Norwich and we do conservation driven original research everything from bioaccumulation of methylmercury in terrestrial ecosystems to following migratory birds as they move across the Western Hemisphere. Um, we do a lot of citizen science projects. I was just talking with Mary about potentially getting involved in one. If you're interested in vernal pools or birds, we do lots of citizen science projects and dozens of opportunities to get involved on a short-term basis, long-term. We have something potentially, if you're interested in citizen science, come talk to me afterwards. I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you about it. Um, and I should say, that it is my distinct pleasure tonight to be able to introduce Dr. Lowell Symes from uh, Dartmouth, that small college across the river over there. <laughs> and uh, Laurel holds a joint appointment. I'm curious how that works. You have two offices? I do. <laughs> uh, so that means when you go to see her, she's in the other one. <laughs> yeah, office hours are always over in the other office, so I guess the team. Absolutely. And this is uh, Laurel, uh, can I call you Laurel? Yes, yeah, so Laurel is. Uh, Newcomb Fellow at Dartmouth, Joint Employment in Psychological and Brain Sciences, and Biology. Okay, wow. that makes me feel humble. Um, expertise in frogs and bats and insects, uh, human communication, true, right? The ecology and evolution and how it shapes how organisms communicate with each other. And um, awfully excited, if so, um, Laurel will give a talk and then we'll have an opportunity for questions afterwards. I just have one question to start us out. Why do they put crickets in suckers? <laughs> it is a great source of protein. <laughs> Health food, we call that. <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. I know with the time change, it feels late, it feels cold, but this is actually the perfect time of day to talk about insects and what they do at night. Um, and so, welcome. So I'm going to start tonight by asking you a non-science question. I'm going to ask you to think of something beautiful. So take a minute, conjure up something beautiful. Okay, what do you have? Anybody? Full moon. Full moon. Sunset. Sunset. Snowstorm. Symphony. Snowstorm. Symphony. Butterfly. Butterfly. Flowers. Grandkids. 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 So lots of different answers. A lot of them are visual. We actually have one acoustic answer. Humans are really visual animals. We use our sense of sight a lot. But tonight I'm going to ask you to come with me uh, into the world of sound. And so we'll start with one of the craziest sounds I've ever heard. See if you can figure out what this is. guesses? What's it? Oh, I thought you were saying, yeah, it was on that whale. That's a good guess. So we're, we're now in the right, the right realm. We're in aquatics. It's not a humpback whale. Any it's not a frog? It's not a frog. It's okay. About the right size. What was the guess? Uh, dolphins. Porpoise. That's a seal. 
<laughs> That's what you get if you drop a microphone under the ice in Antarctica. That's the sound of a Weddell seal. So pretty cool sound that we don't hear because we don't hear well in the water. We're not sticking our head, usually, under the ice in Antarctica. <laughs> um, here's another one that might be a little bit more familiar. Uh, no idea. Any yeah. bird nerds? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bird. It's a great cheek thrush. So it's not a great cheeked thrush. But that might be what we're used to hearing. This is what you get if you slow it down. So I find that pretty amazing. And that works with nearly all bird calls. If you take them and slow them down so that we can hear the structure, you hear all of these swoops and dips in these calls. To most of us, it just sounds like chirp, 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 chirp. But birds have really good temporal processing. So here's another one. This is normal speed. Bobolink, yes. Nice. So again, if we slow it down, we get. are really good at this. They can tell if you make really minor manipulations in these calls. So they're hearing a lot of those details. And a lot of species learn it from each other. Um, so if you're trying to learn bird calls, this is actually, for me, it was really helpful. Because you can take something that goes by too fast and slow it down and track it. And this is a free software from Cornell University. It's called Raven Light. So you can download it, open any WAV file in it, make it whatever speed you want. You can make it faster. So you can make your friends sound like chipmunks. <laughs> you can slow it down and hear all the structure in these sounds. Um, and so it's a really fun tool for kids, for adults, for whoever is trying to learn um, bird calls. So these are still pretty familiar sounds. Here's another one. It comes from the terrestrial world, but might be a little more unusual. It's an insect, you're right. This is, have any of you heard about the pine beetle epidemics out west that are killing thousands and millions of trees? This is one of those pine beetles under the bark. They have little tiny organs that they rub together to make sound, and nobody knows exactly why. Maybe they're staking out a territory, maybe they're calling mates, but there are some scientists now trying to do research on whether you can send sounds through these trees and keep the insects from colonizing trees around houses, around um, shopping centers. But you know, if we hadn't been listening and looking at sounds, we never would have realized that no one would have guessed that beetles make sounds under trees. Yeah, feel free to interrupt with Can questions you hear too. Them from outside the tree? That's, that's a good question. With this species, you can't, but there are some others around, including around here where they are really loud. And you can hear them crunch, crunch. And so you can actually figure out how many bites they're taking and how it changes with temperature and all sorts of things that are probably way out there on the nerdy spectrum. <laughs> but, um, so that's a beetle. That's a pine beetle. They're about the size of a grain of rice. So tiny little things. Microphone, right? they call them um, wood sandwiches, where they take sawdust and they get them right in between so they can get good recordings. And now for what you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. Crickets and katydids, my favorite sound producing animals. So this is a common sound in this part of the world. You might have heard things that sound like this in this area. This is something called a snowy tree cricket. And snowy tree crickets are super cool because people always think of that sound and they think big black cricket that lives on the ground. And those guys are neat too and they do chirp. 
But snowy tree cr crickets look something like this. So I'll send around a couple pictures and you can just take a look and pass. The thing at the top is a snowy tree cricket that you can find in your backyard in Vermont. So, there you go. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> so until I started studying them, I had never seen one. They're really good at hiding under leaves, up in plants. So they're not down on the ground like a lot of crickets. They're up in the vegetation. But we hear them a lot. People love to put them on movie soundtracks. So if you ever see people on a movie walk outside at night and it's chirp, chirp, it's almost always a tree cricket. And it usually sounds like that. But they can also sound like this. So for comparison, the first recording is like this. The second recording is like this. Any guesses what's different between those two recordings? That could be the very same cricket. Temperature. Temperature. In the second recording, that cricket is cold. And so because they're just little, um, you know, essentially physiological reactions in a cricket shell, when it gets warm, those reactions go faster. And when it gets cold, those reactions go slower. And so the rate of chirping actually changes with temperature. And this particular species has been called the thermometer tree cricket because you can count how many times in 13 seconds it chirps, add 40, and then you get the temperature in Fahrenheit. <laughs> so count for 13 seconds, add 40, temperature in Fahrenheit. So the next time your favorite characters walk outside on a movie, and they're wearing shorts and t-shirt and it's a beautiful summer night, count the cricket. They almost always use a slow cold one because it's so majestic, but it's not the right temperature. And I'm sure that doesn't bother anybody else. But <laughs> um, So going a little bit deeper into this sound, we already hear it sounding like this. And you can hear how it's a little bit rough. It's not just pulse, it's doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's slow that down and hear what those pulses are actually actually sound like. So each thing that we hear is chirp is actually in this cricket dun 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 dun. And each of those little dun is one wing closure. So that cricket, when you see those big glassy wings as that goes around, each time you're hearing a pulse, it's actually closing its wings once. So they're incredibly fast. It's like between 40 and 100 times a second, depending on the species. It took me a while before I realized just how fast they were moving. And so when we hear dun 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 dun, that's eight separate wing closures that come together so fast that we just hear this chirp. And there's some variation between them. So some individuals of snowy tree crickets will go dun 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 five. Others go dun 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 eight. And then there's another species that adds one more group of three and goes dun 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 dun. And a couple years ago we described a new species from Texas that adds one more. And so it looks like you know, new species have arisen by adding new little chunks of this sound. And then the females response to that sound, because the males are calling to draw in a female, that response tracks with what the male is doing, and we're getting new species through that route. Um, yes, questions? Um, so you're saying this tree cricket rubs its wings. Yes. I thought crickets rub their legs. That's a great, qu great point. Grasshoppers rub their, their legs, sorry. Crickets and katydids rub wings, which I didn't know until I was already in grad school, so that's not common knowledge, but <laughs> crickets, wings, katydids, wings, grasshoppers, legs, cicadas, the big insects that produce sound, they're actually going in and out with their stomach. Um, so they pull in their equivalent of ribs and then they go snap, 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 all the way out, and that's what makes that incredibly loud sound. And so, yeah, that's super energetically intensive. It takes a lot of calories to do that. And so they basically sit there plugged into tree sap, which is like Coca-Cola for insects. And they're just drinking sugar and making sound. And if you go to the tropics, you can actually see it like rain cicada pee. It's somewhere between spectacularly cool and totally disgusting. Um, but it takes a lot of energy. 
And so that's one of the things that we were doing um, in our research program is trying to understand why are different species producing different types of sounds? How do they, what causes them to diverge between species? If you have a lot of species in the same place, are they using, you know, are some species using sounds that cost more energy to produce because they can't all produce the same sound? So it's like shells in an electron, in the electron orbitals, like is some species getting pushed to places that are really expensive? And so one of the things that we did was we quantified how many calories per minute crickets burn when they sing. And so you can do that just by measuring how much carbon dioxide they produce in the same way that when we run, we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. When a cricket sings, it produces carbon dioxide and we can measure it and determine how much it costs to make sound as a cricket. And this seemed like an interesting project, but it actually ended up being really cool because it turns out um, I played this chirping species, but a lot of the species just go da -da 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 and call and call. If you look at all of those different pulse rates, they cost exactly the same amount of energy across species, which is not at all what we expected to see. And so I spent about a year scratching my head about this. This is really hard to explain to the people that you work with. Like this cricket closes its wings twice as many times per second and is burning exactly the same number of calories to do so. Like that doesn't work. But if you look on that handout that went around, what happens when a cricket closes its wings is it rubs a bunch of little tiny teeth on one wing across the other wing. And that turns out to be the answer, that as they close their wings more and more often, they're rubbing fewer and fewer teeth. So they get a faster pulse rate, but they're shorter pulses. So some species might go pulse, 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 three pulses, you know, about one second of sound. Other species are going pulse, 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 pulse. And if you slide all that sound together in all those species, they're all making exactly the same amount of sound. And so that was for us a really interesting insight about how animals are using energy, how these signals diverge across species because before we had sort of envisioned like a new species might just draw a new call from the random pool of sounds that insects can make, but it actually suggests that there are really defined clusters of what sort of sounds insects can make that are maybe somewhat predictable. And so for us, that was a, a fun insight. The other thing we wanted to know is as males change in their calls from species to species, how are the females responding to this? I mean, the whole reason that a male cricket makes sound is to attract a mate. But if this species produces 40 pulses in a second and this species produces 60, like how are the females of each species finding the males of their own species? And so one of the really nice things about these crickets is that you can write about this much computer code and it makes a cricket sound. And so we could make fake crickets and we could make them sound however we wanted to. So it's one of those things that you go home really excited about and your roommates are like, mm-hmm, that's great. I'm so happy for you. But it's awesome because then you can go to different places and map out what are the pulse rates that different species respond to depending on, you know, are there really similar species in the same spot? Well, maybe they have to be really good at finding their own species. Oh, they're the only thing there. Maybe they can respond to a whole bunch. So this is a little bit of the results from that project. Is it only males that sing? In crickets, it generally is. There are some species of katydids where the males sing, and then the females will make a, a little tick sound in reply at a very specific time interval, and then they start to duet. And so she's basically encouraging him to keep singing, and then he'll come find her based on that sound, rather than crickets where the females will walk into the males. So. This, <coughs> give me just a moment to get these two sounds open side by side. Um, actually, it might take me just a moment. I'm going to open them in two different programs so that I can play a really attractive cricket and a really unattractive cricket. <laughs> So this, oops, sorry. That is a really unattractive cricket. <laughs> um, so this is a synthetic sound. This is an unattractive cricket. This is it's now the species that just calls and calls and calls. It doesn't sound that great, but this is an attractive cricket. 
So the first sound attracts about 10% of females. That second sound attracts about 90%. So one more time. This is an unattractive cricket. And this is an attractive cricket. So it's a difference between about 58 pulses a second and about 64 pulses a second. So they are really, really good at picking out these differences that to us are essentially invisible. And that has some interesting implications that we didn't necessarily see when we started down that path. So for example, there's been a lot of thought recently about how road noise affects animal communication. And we see effects on birds, we see it on whales, all sorts of things. It impacts how much time they spend signaling, where they signal, how easy it is for them to find each other. And so there was a student who did a senior thesis with me that wanted to know, well, how about crickets? Does, you know, they're pervasive, they're everywhere, they're often by roads. Does the presence of road noise affect their ability to find males? And so she took a speaker that made a road noise. So we recorded the road and set it up and calibrated it. So we're playing a pretty loud road. And then we put a speaker that plays a male cricket. And the females are amazingly good at finding the sound. You know, they'll orient and walk right to the sound, even in the middle of like, truck traffic, which is different than for a lot of other species. But it made us think, crickets for millions and millions of years mm -hmm have not been the loudest thing in the environment. They've had to evolve to be really good at finding sounds in the midst of noise. So maybe they're already tuned to deal with this particular problem compared to species like birds and whales that historically have been some of the loudest things around. And so for us, this was an interesting insight about how the evolutionary history of an animal and the way that its sensory system works affects whether or not it experiences um, negative impacts from human activities. So, before I leave this topic, any questions about crickets? We're about to move into Katie Dids. <laughs> All right. I was kind of yes. like, in, you would expect in the beginning of summer to be a lot of noise because it's, they've got time to reproduce, but toward the end of the season, when there's really no chance of success, I would think no chance of success. Your logic is right. That by the time you get to the end of the season, like, time is tight. But what that often translates to is that they take insane risks. So they'll call in the daytime, they'll call at night. You know, normally they don't call as much because things will find them and eat them. You know, that can be birds, it can be um, these flies that target crickets. They have ears that have evolved specially to hear them and the flies find the cricket and lay an egg and then the egg turns into a larva that eats inside the, yeah. Okay, so, but, <laughs> um, so the logic is right that it's getting close to the end. But what they do usually is give it everything they have and try to mate and lay eggs before frost. And then those eggs will winter over and start again the next spring. So, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? So no cricket adults over the winter? There are some species, particularly in farther south, that do. There's one species here that will overwinter as a juvenile and then molt early in the spring. So the first thing you hear in the spring that goes chirp, 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 and is big and black is a cricket, um, Gryllus filatus, so the spring field cricket that started as a juvenile in the fall and then went through. Yeah. How about pheromones and smell? Pheromones and smell matter for crickets. Um, so sound tends to be the long range signal where they can hear it you know, a few yards away. But then when they get close, they will go through this whole elaborate series of like touching each other with their antenna and they're actually picking up, they're called hydrocarbons, but they're basically molecules that are on the other cricket and they're essentially tasting them um, to see whether they're the same species, whether they're in good condition, whether they have parasites, um, all sorts of things. That said, with some of these tree crickets where they have a pulse rate that's like 50 pulses per second, you can take crickets from New York, one species that's black and yellow and big, and they have 50 pulses a second. And then you go to Montana and you get this little tiny species that's green and also makes 50 pulses per second. They'll totally mate with each other. It's amazing. And then you get things from the same place that look a lot alike, but you know, one's 50 pulses, one's 70 pulses a second. Nothing. They won't do it. So. It's pretty wild how much sound matters, but pheromones, especially for like the big black crickets that live on the ground, pheromones are mm -hmm. quite important for them. Less so for the tree crickets because they're up in the vegetation and they don't have as much ability to follow 
and detect pheromones that are on the ground. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Are there aspects of both quality and quantity in the pulses? I mean, is there selection for males to have the best um, call? That's a great question with a complicated answer. <laughs> um, so some of the, what we were trying to understand with making fake crickets is like, if you can make a cricket that is faster and longer than what the males actually do, do females like that more? Are males up against this physiological boundary? And again, if you look on, those gra on that handout that went around, if you need one graph to make this a science talk, I put the one graph on there. That's the pulse rate and pulse duration of all of those species. And you see that there's a big open area. Those are calls that would have a faster pulse rate and a longer pulse duration than the males can actually do. So we make those. And the females sometimes like them. But the problem is that by making that, you often make something that sounds like another species. So you make the pulse rate faster, but now you've pushed into the zone of something else that's in that same spot. And in that case, the females don't like it. And so you can go place to place and map out, well, what species are here? If there's nothing faster, the females really like faster. But if they're stuck in between stuff, then the females like what the males do, which is, becomes a really interesting scenario. Like in Texas, a lot of species are expanding their ranges right now. There's a species of tree cricket that's moved north into that area. And so now the species that used to be the fastest one there is no longer the fastest. And so females are, you know, had historically responded to that, but now that's a bad decision. And so you can actually watch preferences evolve over the course of our lifetime. This is about 50 years that they've been in contact. And you can go north and find more recent contact and south and find longer contact. Um, so it's also an interesting model for understanding, well, what about other species where they're harder to study? Like are there some species that are more likely to interfere with each other? So a longer answer than you might have been looking for, but yes. So you said if you took a cricket from one place that wasn't really like another, but they had the same number of, uh, or the same modulation in their song that they yeah. made with each other, do they have viable offspring? Great question. Um, so I have not been in the same place for a full year in the last five years to do this experiment. Um, my guess with those two species that I mentioned is that they are probably too different and those eggs wouldn't develop. But there are probably also combinations where that could happen, where something's introduced to an area and it's similar enough that you get hybridization and gene flow. Yeah. Yeah, Th those would be fun experiments to do. Yeah. Yes? Um, do the tree crickets have a preference for what trees they spend time in? Some of them do and some of them don't particularly. So we have a species around here. Um, one, probably our most common species is called Acanthus pinei. And as you might guess, they live in pine trees. And I've never found them outside of a pine tree. I've never found anything else in a pine tree. They're sort of their own special thing. But then in like old fields where it's just weedy, you know, goldenrod and you know, ironweed and stuff like that, there are three or four species that are just mixed all through there. And so those were the ones that I was studying for how interacting with and hearing other species would affect what females are able to recognize. Um, yeah. Yes. We've lived in the Upper Valley for almost 50 years, and we've noticed such enormous change in all of the species in terms of when they show up and yeah. so forth. This being a very dynamic area for climate change, are there other areas that are uh, far more stable? In other words, where you get very, very little shift in the species, whereas here I'm assuming you get a lot more dynamic change. It's an interesting question. Um, to some extent, that's a question I should also throw to my colleagues about how, how quickly different areas are changing. But in places like the Midwestern US, there's so much climatic variability to year, from year to year that the species there tend to be pretty stable. Like it's warm, you know, they, they deal with that. I would be, the range expansions that we've seen are actually all over the place, like Texas, Wisconsin, um, here, seems to be, I'll be curious, up in northern New Hampshire, we don't have tree crickets right now, and that may change within our lifetime. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. One of the things that I think insects are really good for is putting out automated recorders and being able to see exactly when things show up in an area, and you know, what's the first day they're active, what's the last day they're active. 
about how many do we have, things like that. So no answer, but good question. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's shift over to Katie Ditch for a little bit, um, and then I'm happy to answer questions about anything at the end. So we've been talking a lot about crickets, and I love tr crickets, and I could talk about crickets until all of you are bored and sleepy, and, <laughs> but Katie Ditch are pretty cool, too. So part of my work is here, part of my work is in Panama. And one of the things that's really neat about the tropics is simply the number of species that you find at the same time in the same place. So here we have between 10 and 20 species of calling insects. On Barro, Colorado Island in Panama, where I do my research, there are more than 100 species of katydids that are active at the same time in the same place. So when you think about this challenge of using, you know, they have about 100 neurons in their auditory system. We have a few billion. How, how do you use 100 neurons to find a male of the same species? We don't fully know the answer to this. It just amazes me that it's possible. Um, so the place that we work is called Barrow, Colorado Island. It's a Smithsonian research station in the middle of the Panama Canal. It was formed when they built the canal. Um, there was this big island, or this big mountain in the middle. They're like, we're not moving that. They just took the canal around it. So now it's a six square mile research station. If you ever had the chance to visit, it's a really neat spot. Um, but it has lots and lots of species. And this is a really powerful situation for being able to understand what's similar and what's different across species because now you have enough species that you can measure for all of them, for example, what their hearing thresholds are like. So we do it in a similar way to how hearing tests work at the doctor's office. You start with a really quiet sound at one pitch. So let's say we're starting at five kilohertz, start low. And then you turn it up and turn it up and turn it up until, for us, you start to hear it. For them, we're actually measuring action potentials off of their auditory nerve. And so you can tell at each pitch how loud it has to be before they start to react. One of the interesting things about katydids, both here and in Panama, is that they can hear ultrasound. So we hear up to about 20 kilohertz. They hear up to about 100. And this is a really surprise. well, it's surprising at first until you think about how katydids die. And one of the primary predators, particularly in the tropics, are bats. And so these bats hear katydids and they hunt them by the sounds that they make. So the males are singing, trying to attract a female. Not only do they have to attract a female in the midst of 100 other species, they have to attract a female while being hunted by bats. Like, that just seems like a bad deal. Um, and yet, there are a lot of katydids. So I have some pictures here um, that show you a little bit of the diversity of katydids, as well as some of what we do for sampling them. How many katydids are in the upper valley? Uh, in this area, I think we would find between, sorry, between four and six species. Um, there might be a few more than that if you're willing to go to some of the specialized habitats. But um, our major one is something called a neoconocephalus. And as you can guess from the comb part of the name, neocon, they have this really sharp nose. And they sit in the grass and they go, you might have heard this sound. Uh, they also can hear bats. So if you take a set of keys, keys produce ultrasound when you jangle them. So you can walk up and go, and usually the Katie Dib will stop calling. It's sort of a fun party trick. <laughs> um, but then if you're hanging out with scientists, you have to convince them that it wasn't just sound that did it, that it was ultrasound. So then you have to shake other things. And before you know it, it's you know, 10 o'clock and you're three beers in. And it's, <laughs> the night is over. Um, but one of the challenges that we run into in this site is how do we sample Katie Dids and what they're doing? So this is one of the reasons that they haven't been well studied. You know, we're still finding new species that have never been described. In part because they live at the top of tropical trees. And so some researchers have described the tropics as like the last, or the, um, the canopy is the last frontier. You know, we've gone to all the continents, we've you know, pretty much mapped. We don't know that much about what's up there. And so when we were starting this project, it's like, Panama is amazing, there are a bunch of species. This is the perfect opportunity for understanding signal recognition and signal processing. We need to get to the katydids. And do you ever have that moment where you've made a decision about something that needs to happen before you've thought through the logistics of what that involves? <laughs> so I'm actually kind of afraid of heights. 
<laughs> and suddenly I found myself at Cornell University, which teaches an eight-hour tree climbing course, <laughs> where they teach you how to tie these knots and you know, hook up these ropes. And before you know it, you're on Amazon buying like $400 of tree climbing equipment on the way to Panama, <laughs> having spent eight hours tree climbing. So we get down there, and amazingly, it works. You know, the first step is this eight foot long slingshot. And so you take this and you shoot a, a weight and a line over the branch. And then you can use that line to pull up your rope. But actually, by now, everything's tangled and wrapped around branches. So you've had, and you missed your branch, so you pull it down and you try again. But eventually, you get your rope up. And then you use something called the senders to climb. So they're these handled things that slide up and not down. So you can slide one up and slide. Then you step your foot in the lower one. Then you stand up. And then you can slide the upper one. And so you can actually, it's sort of like going upstairs. You can get up these trees. Um, but we went up and we put recorders up in the canopy where we can actually get the ultrasound um, that these insects are making, because a lot of it doesn't come down to the ground. Um, and there are a few interesting things that come out of these recordings. One is exactly how much time these insects spend producing sound. So our katydids here, on a particular night, might call between four and five hours. How much do you think katydids call in the tropics? That was my guess. I even had students with me one of the first times I went to the tropics. And it was like, you, you've heard the, the katydid chorus in North America? That's like 10 or 20 species. There are 100 here. This is going to be amazing. And we walked outside, and it was really quiet. <laughs> it's like, huh, maybe there aren't katydids here. And then you walk to the lights, and there are all these like, cool leaf-shaped insects sitting there. It's like, no, there are katydids here. What's, what's going on? They don't sing very much. Or at least some species do, and some species don't. So there are some species that, you know, if you put them in front of a microphone, they sing 80,000 times in a night. There's an, another species that sings about 20 times. And so you think, well, 20 times, maybe they're producing long sounds. This is an example of what that sound sounds like. So. Are you ready for this? This is a rotafeste. That's it. I'll do it one more time. And that's all the female might have to work with for the next 45 minutes. So it's, it's quite high, yep. And it's quite fast. And we can slow it down so that you hear some of the structure in it. And it also brings it a little bit lower, which might make it easier to hear as well. So it's seven pulses. It goes up a little bit in frequency. But the whole thing lasts about 0 0.04 seconds. So about half of the species that we've looked at are producing less than five seconds of sound per night. And they're finding each other in a forest where there are other species that sing a lot. To this day, I have no idea how they do it. This is one of the things that really interests me about their sensory system, about their biology. How do they find each other in a forest? Um, you know, probably one of the answers for why they call so little is because it is so risky to call. You, know, you can go under the roosts of these bats, and it's just littered with katydid wings. So it's a really dangerous thing. But it makes us think about whether they're maybe using some other strategies that we don't normally see um, insects, or especially katydids here, using. So for example, maybe they're host plant specialists. Maybe each of those 100 species is living on a different plant. This sounded like a really great idea, or you know, something that could explain this well. But it's hard to know what plant they're living on. <laughs> so a couple years ago, we figured out that you can actually take the plants that are in their stomach. And you can sequence the DNA of those plants and ask, is the same species of katydid always eating the same species of plant? And the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> this was surprising to me. Um, but they do seem to eat broadly the same family of plants. So they might have the ability to detoxify particular compounds or even microbes that help them detoxify particular compounds. But we don't. It's not the answer, or it's not the answer alone. Another thing that we've thought about is maybe they're using vibration. 
So they can only sing a little bit because it's really dangerous. But they can also shake branches. And they do it in species-specific patterns. So some of them go, dun, 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 dun. And others go, dun, 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 <laughs> for like 10 or 15 seconds. Um, others will whack their body against a stem. And so you get, dun, 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 quack, dun, 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 whack. Mm -hmm. So there are species-specific vibrations. So maybe this is helpful, that the sound gets you in the same broad vicinity, and then the vibration helps you get right to the insect. These are all things that we're investigating. The answer is probably different for different species among that hundred. There's probably not a single answer. Um, so I'm going to, I started tonight with a sound. And I'm going to leave you tonight with a sound. I mentioned that we were climbing and putting these recorders up in the canopy to see what's actually going on. I'm going to take one of those recordings and first play it for you. And then I'm going to slow it down so that you can hear the different elements in the forest. So just a moment. Sorry. Oh, before that, one more thing. This is a compilation of 10 different katydid sounds so that you can hear 10 of the species from that site. So this is full speed. Yeah, I should mention that most of them are above 15 kilohertz, so they're at the upper edge of human hearing range. And if you're not in a direct line, you might not get them. So again, you can sort of do a hearing test with these. Or <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> T turn them up and bring them down. Again, do those again. It's playing. It's playing. <laughs> <laughs> so now we, down. This, this is full speed. This is slowed down. And they will also come down in pitch so that they'll be easier to hear. OK. Same species. <laughs> not the same one all the time. No. So those are 10 different species of Katie did. And now I will. <laughs> Even within our research group, we're noticing that we're starting to not hear all of them that we used to hear. It's really kind of saddening. Um, so oops. this is, let me get it set up here. So this is a regular speed recording um, from the canopy. So this is what it would sound like at night in a tropical forest. So there's a lot of sound, but a lot of what we're hearing are crickets that are low down. The katydids are the occasional chirps and dings that you hear. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you didn't hear in that recording is that there's a bat that flew through partway through. So now I'm going to pull it down to be a little bit slower and also a little bit lower. So that wash of sound again as the crickets now slowed down and brought. So Katie did, Katie did. Bat. Dun, 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 dun. That's the bat. Yeah. And you hear the bat get faster. That's called a feeding buzz. So they've gotten close to a prey item and they're echolocating more rapidly in order to get more information as they close in. So now the bat's coming back through. Katie did. And even though you can hear a Katie did after the bat, one of the things that we've done is compare how much insect sound you have before the bat's there compared to how much sound is present when the bat is there. And you can actually hear the insect community draw down as the bat comes through that part of the forest. And originally, we thought, oh, that must last a long time. And really, it lasts about three seconds. As soon as the bat's gone, 
the they're able to hear the echolocation calls. And so we can play those to the auditory nerve and again see the reaction. And do, we also do playbacks in the lab where we have an individual, Katie did, that's singing away and we play bats and you can see them or hear them stop. Another yeah. party trick. Another party trick, exactly. You have to take your party to the tropics, but you know, they're usually willing. <laughs> yes. On the outside of the auditory nerve, it was extracellular, not intracellular. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I should clarify that my collaborator is the one who's really good at that. I am not especially really good at it. <laughs> um, and then here is one more. Um, this is just a, a different insect community, um, same sort of setup, but you can hear. Now there's a, so I mentioned that there are katydids that sing very little, there, and there are also some species that sing a lot. And maybe they're singing from protected locations, we don't know quite, but you'll hear one of those species in here in addition to bats. Yeah. yeah, so there are lots of them all calling. And they're, again, they're calling from protected places so they can get away with it. But it means that they don't have access to eat all the leaves that are up in the trees. They're having to, to scrounge. Yes? What type of bats are they? There are 70 different species of bats no, on the they're, island. They're, in this particular recording, yeah. I don't know what species of bat it is. A lot of the echolocate, that's, I mean, it's a great question and we would love to. Um, the person that I collaborate with who studies bats could tell you what family it was in at least. Um, but as far as what exact species, I don't know. <laughs> Do we have um, a lot more katydids because the bats are gone? We have a lot of katydids in the summer. Um, I, the because of white nose, I've wondered this and I've contemplated taking a special trip out to areas that don't have white nose and putting up long-term recorders before you know, areas that it seems likely that's going to move there. I haven't had the, the time or the funds to be able to, to do it, but it would be, it would be really neat. Um, hopefully there's an increasing number of nature centers and things like that have long-term recorders out, so hopefully there are people in the right places um, that are able to get those. I've heard uh, some Grammy award winners that don't sound that nice. <laughs> it's an amazing sound. I can't take credit for it beyond you know, having it on, on a disc, but it's, <laughs> yeah, and we have, 60 days worth of recording at full speed. So if you need something to sleep to at night, <laughs> we're actually totally, totally happy to share these recordings. And you know, yeah, it's about four and a half terabytes. So yeah, it's a lot of sound. But at the same time, it's not just Katie did. So you know, speaking of the value of recording and archiving sound in the tropics, one of the big concerns is chytrid fungus, which attacks um, lots of frogs and amphibians and has caused extinctions all through that area. And unlike bats where we had decent recordings of at least the bat population size before white nose from automated recorders, in Central America we had almost no idea um, what the population size for some of these things are. So that's part of why we're trying to create these recordings through the full 24 hours and archive them, make them available. As they don't just have crickets, we have howler monkeys, that's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, just, you're scanning through like crickets, 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 howler monkey. Uh, there are parrots, there are all sorts of fun things on those recordings. Yeah. Yes. Do you have software that listens to your recordings and catalogs them, or do you do that? Um, no, so I've been writing code to find instances of that calls and then running it on Dartmouth Cluster. 
um, which is a big computing center that can run lots and lots of sound at the same time. But a couple weeks ago, I woke up to an email from the, the folks at the cluster that say, you know, dear Laurel, were you running a large job last night? Because we noticed the, cl the cluster is full, and it took us a while to be able to troubleshoot what the issue was because it was completely full. It's like, mm, yep, that was, <laughs> turned out I had an error in the code, and they had <laughs> lots and lots of files. So. But I'm getting better at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are yes. KDDs not equally susceptible to bad predation? So if you go and call 20 times a night, 80,000 times a night. Yes. So we're working also with a bat researcher who has a, a camera on a couple of the roosts with an infrared beam. And every time a bat flies through there, it takes a picture. And you can see what they're carrying often. And so we're working now to go through those and identify what species of katydids are getting eaten and what time of year. And, but you know, it's not a perfect system because certain katydids, probably the bats get, and they're like, hmm, this one's small and tasty, and they just knock it back and keep going as opposed to <laughs> taking it back. <laughs> uh -huh. so at one point, I used the phrase, katydid chips are the potato. Katie did sort of potato chips of the rainforest, and ever since then, my colleagues have teased me for that. <laughs> Just so tasty. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. So are they only making the sound for mating? I mean, they can't like birds can you know the warning there's a bat, so they they only have one sound and that's for mating, and there's no other like. Yeah. Hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't know for sure because they do produce a defensive sound. So if you grab them, some of them will go tick, and I, the thought is that that startles a predator and gives them a chance to escape. Um, so they they produce defensive sounds. They produce sounds to attract mates, and they also produce sounds to squabble with their neighbors. Like, this is my territory, no, get out, get out. And so we'll, we'll get those dynamics in our recordings also. Um, whether they send the bats coming through warning, we don't have any indication of that. But what we do see is on recordings, when there is no background noise at all, so if you just put them in a room by themselves, they really don't like to sing. And if you play the sounds even of other species, they'll sing a lot more, presumably, because if there, are, you know, if there are a bunch of us in this room and a bat comes through, only one of us is going to get. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to have friends. Um, but we see that sort of dynamic. Yeah. Hmm, maybe not quite the right thing to say in this venue. <laughs> <laughs> Are other insects or even other animals in the forest tuned into their the insects' various communications so they know what insects are telling them about their environment? We have no idea. That would be an interesting thing to know. Um, one of the things that surprised me was that the cricket chorus will drop a little bit also when a bat comes through, and I don't know whether that's the crickets responding to the bat itself, or whether they are actually responding to the fact that the katydid band has become quieter. Because the bat calls tend to be pretty directional, you know, just going out in a narrow beam from the bat. And if the crickets are in a burrow, they're not necessarily hearing that. And so the, there might be a couple layers of eavesdropping. So are there other insects that the bat would be feeding on that could tune into the katydid's change in sound? Conceivably. Um, the biggest response of the katydids is actually to just stop calling and freeze because flying is incredibly dangerous and these bats can even hear walking sounds. So for other things, you know, can they hear and then stop what they're doing? I don't know the answer. Um, that would be a praying mantis seem like an interesting candidate for that. Um, they also have ultrasound ears and they're a bunch of mantids in the tropics and they also get eaten by bats. Yeah. We need to find a way to determine whether or not those species are hearing it. So maybe measuring, you know, katydids are easy because they stop and start calling. Um, but we'd have to measure maybe neural activity in those guys. Yeah. Those are, those are a highly skewed sex ratio in katydids because the males are getting you would think so. It's really hard to census the sex ratio, but one of the interesting observations is that we don't catch the same sex ratio of all species. So in some species, 80% of what we catch at lights is male, 
and in some species, half of what we catch at lights is male. And interestingly, it correlates with the difference. This is, this is the science part of the science in suds. It correlates with the body size difference between males and females. So if females are really big and they're investing a lot, and the males are small, we catch almost all males, suggesting that maybe the females are sitting tight and letting the males do the work of coming to them. But if they're about equal size, then we catch about 50-50 male and female. So. Yeah, I would love to know exactly how many there are and what the sex ratio is in the forest. It's one of those things that feels like it should be easy and actually turns out to be really hard. <laughs> yeah. And the katydids breed continuously throughout the year in the tropics? We don't know. Um, so Do they I'm. We don't even know that. Um, one of the things that we'd like to do in the longer run is put equipment out that stays out for a full year. Um, We've always been there January through March, both because of teaching schedules and because that's the dry season, which is good for the thousands of dollars of equipment that it takes <laughs> to record them. Um, but we're trying to find people now who can stay through more of the, it might be a hundred different species six months later, or they might be there all the time, or that might be the time. So there's a lot we don't know in the tropics particularly. Yeah, did you have? Yeah, so if you have 100 species of katydids, how many species of nocturnal insects are you doing? Sheets out on the lights? We catch at the lights mostly katydids and beetles and a few hymenoptera and flies. So we catch probably 350 species, I would guess, at, at lights if you're talking all insects, in terms of what's actually out in the forest, it has to be tens of thousands. There's only a subset that are attracted to lights. And there are also geckos that live on the island. And little things at the lights disappear really fast. And so what we're seeing is definitely a filtered collection of what's coming to the lights. <laughs> well, we've talked about the gecko relocation project, but you know, mostly sat on our hands. <laughs> you just have to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there sexual selection or is it just the first one finding the mate? We assume that there's sexual selection, but that's something that we're working on testing now. So there's a few indications that there probably is. So sexual selection is variance in mating success between males. So do all males have equal mating success and pass on their genes equally well, or do some males mate hundreds of times and other males not at all? Um, one of the things about these katydids is that the males give a nuptial gift. So they, and insects here do it also, but they present, um, they're transferred to the female, not just sperm, but also lots of proteins and fats um, in like a casing. We're getting technical here, I'm sorry. I hope you had your dinner already. Um, <laughs> so here it might be a few percent of the body mass. In the tropics, it could be 15 or 20 percent of the male's body mass. So they're investing hugely in these matings, and that's probably also something that goes with the low calling behavior, is because males aren't investing a lot in advertising that they're there, they're incentivizing the female to continue searching, because when she finds a male, it's going to be very re rewarding. So. Probably sexual selection, but it will take quite a bit to actually measure mating success of different males. Yeah. So. The next big frontier, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. And, and Katie did, and science, and yeah. <laughs> just in general. Um, I think understanding the linkage between neurobiology and behavior is a big piece of it. Um, you know, sensory systems for us are the connection between the internal and external world that takes all the information around us and brings it in. You know, whether if we're talking about human brain sciences and fMRI advances or insect neurobiology where you can look at a network with a hundred neurons and ask how are these things connecting, how are they resolving signals, I think that's going to keep us busy for quite a while <laughs> to come. But I think it will give some really interesting insights um, both about behavior and about evolution and how behaviors change. Yeah. Yes. So on a local level, Dr. Simes, is there, I'm sure you inspired a lot of us to be more interested in ornithopter and neighbors. As citizen scientists, uh, is there yeah. anything we could do to contribute to knowledge of yeah. 
cadence and tree crickets around here. I noticed you have like hundreds of recordings of these guys at the Cornell yeah. uh, Sound Library. Yeah. Or simply documenting phenology, like the emergence in the spring yeah. changes over the years? Or That's a fun question. The, because there are only a handful of species here and they sound pretty different, it would be pretty conceivable for you know, interested citizen scientists to learn four or five calls and really be able to peg across this local landscape, like what's the first date each year that we hear them and what's the last date? I think from a climate point of view, that's one of the most interesting variables. And it's you know, nicely discreet, like you go out one night, nothing, and then you go out another night, and it's like, oh, I hear them, they're here. Um, there's a couple of really good websites that I can provide to you or I can share publicly that have information about identifying them and you know, also sound recording has become incredibly cheap over the last few years. You know, 20 years ago it was like high-end photography where, you know, you had to have the right tapes and the, you know, haul the batteries and, you know, now this is a sound recorder that's better than anything that existed 10 or 15 years ago and you can get it for a few hundred dollars. Um, and then there are things that are even cheaper for, you know, 20 to 30 where you can make your recordings and slow them down and, um, if you go out to make insect recordings, a couple of tips on that. Um, one is if you have a way to note the temperature, do it because so many of these species change with temperature um, that you'll have a much better chance of identifying what your insect is if you know even roughly um, what the temperature was in Fahrenheit. And then, yeah, just go out to weedy fields and get a good headlamp. That's the other thing. I did a couple years with a bad headlamp and boy, being able to see, you know, with a fifty or sixty dollar headlamp, if you're really into it, makes a huge difference. Um, and you can actually see them calling. Like you can watch the wings move, and you know, if you're super patient, you can see females walk up. So males are the ones making sounds. Females have ovipositors that they use to lay eggs. So ova egg, it's just this long sword-like thing that comes out of the end of the female's body. Um, and then our Katie did's around here. The body's like that, and the sword is like that. So they're called um, so sword-bearing katydids. Um, and it, it can't sting you or anything like that. If, if you press on it, it has give. Um, but that's how you know if you're looking at a female. So you can actually watch pairs interact and you know, catch them and keep them in the kitchen and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's just me. <laughs> 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 yes. Does your headlamp disturb their activity? It can. Um, so I will sometimes use red lamps. Or usually if I stay like the distance from me to this gentleman, they will continue to do what they do. It depends a lot on the individual and the temperature. The warmer it is, the more likely they are to keep doing what they're doing. If it's cold and the dew is settling, once they stop, they're probably done. And again, that probably goes to how easy it is for them to escape. When it's warm, you know, they're really good at getting away. The, the ones with the swords, they just fold their legs and they drop into the grass. And you're like, oh, I can find that. But you know, they have this cone, they go straight down, and then they take one jump. I, I've mostly given up trying to dig them out at that point and just go find another one. <laughs> like, it's just not going to happen. Every once in a while, you get lucky. So, Are they attracted to light? Mildly. Not as much around here as in the tropics. Uh, what might actually be happening is that there's just so much light around here that you put up a black light in a sheet and they don't come to that compared to all these other lights. But if you look at buildings, you sometimes see them. Um, yeah. Tree crickets, not so much. Tree crickets, you actually have to go and track down. Yeah, because obviously by moths sound. love light. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, especially the driving range down in West Lab has these awesome lights that are on at night. So for moths, you see all sorts of things, but I might see one or two katydids there in an evening. Yeah, if you haven't, go down, buy a bucket of golf balls, give it to somebody else, and go look at the moths. They're amazing. <laughs> well, I'm sure Dr. Sines would stick around for a yeah, few minutes happy to answer hang questions. Out. If you fail to get your question asked tonight, visit one of our two offices. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm happy to answer insect questions by email too. Yeah, That's there's, fine. there's no talk in December, but we'll pick back up in January. And if you have any questions for me or our director, Chris Rimmer, uh, I'll be around. And tremendous thank you, Dr. Yeah. Sanders. Yeah.